Peter Bletchley, started his career in the police. He's been in organised crime, brought down gangs in London. Thanks for having me. I just loved nicking people. Turned around and levelled a 2-2 two -two pistol at me. Well, how did that work out, everybody? If they're a good cop, I don't give a damn what they call themselves or what their pronouns are. Mine are bloke and geezer, by the way. What was that first gig? Oh, I was buying a half a kilo of cocaine off some South American drug dealer. And I said, yeah, right, I'll have a go at that. I've given the signal for the arrest team to come in and nothing's happened. Pump, 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 spurting out my head and all hell broke loose. I could build you a joint like a baby's arm. If you feel like you're forced into a corner and you've got to take that line of Charlie or you've got to smoke that joint, you better be able to justify it. We put hundreds of people away for thousands and thousands. Make it sound like popping down the shop for a can of coke. Mate, you're not the local drug dealer, are you? No, just no, no, no. We're going to edit that bit out afterwards. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs>
for me to apply to become a police cadet. And I filled them out, stuck them in the post. And a few short weeks later, I'd had a haircut, which I thought was short enough and suitable enough for the police. On my first day in Hendon, I realised it wasn't. And they packaged me off to uh, have it cut even shorter. And suddenly I found the discipline that had been missing, really, that I'd disrespected at school and hadn't found and I needed in my life because a lot of the instructors, particularly the physical training instructors, they were former Royal Marines, these guys, you know, and for a living, they walked around in their vests, you know, and their tight-fitting tracksuit bottoms and their sparkling white plimsolls. They were very disciplined and regimented and well turned out. And if you leant against the wall and they went, oi, Blexley, down to 10 press-ups, or what, wasn't an option because they'd have just taken you into the dojo, you know, the judo gym, yep. and turned you into a crowd in the blink of an eye, and that would have been that. And, and and I responded to that discipline. I got fit. I learned self-respect and self-discipline as well, and had a great time. And you're at, what, what, 16, 17, 18 at this point? Yep, so that was from 17 to 18 and a half. And the last six months of that time in the cadets, I was actually posted to a police station. Didn't have the powers of a constable, but I rode along with them and I walked with the beat bobbies and all of that. So I had a really good ground it for six months. It was in a place called Norbury, which was just south of Streatham. So yeah, an inner city area. Got a lot of experience in a very short space of time. I also made hundreds and hundreds of cups of tea as well because you were the cadet, you know what I mean? So know your place. But I had a really good time. Then went back to Hendon, to the other end of the estate, because I was sworn in as a constable, then became a PC, did the training there, which was pretty intensive. But because I'd had a leg up by being in the cadets, I excelled at the training. I ended up being the top student in my class again, thrived on the discipline. And then at the age of 18 and a half, got posted to Peckham in South East London. So that, that's that's your first job? Yeah. And what, what are you, like a bobby on the beat? Yeah, PC on the beat. So enthusiastic. Just wanted to nick people, you know, nick criminals. It's what I wanted to do. In fact, back in those days, they had school crossing patrols. So on the zebra crossing, if the lollipop lady or the lollipop man went sick or was on holiday for a week, a PC would be allocated to that school crossing. So you'd help the kids and their parents across the road. Sod that for a game of soldiers, right? So if at the six o'clock briefing, the sergeant said, right, PC Blexley, you're on uh, Summer House Lane, school crossing patrol from 7.30 to 8.40. I'd make sure I nicked someone before 7.30 so I couldn't go and do it, you know, because I just didn't want to do that. I didn't join to help old ladies across the street. And I know that's all a valuable part of policing, or it was in those days, but for me, it held no allure whatsoever. What I wanted to do was nick burglars, car thieves, drug dealers, robbers, shoplifters, all that kind of stuff. I just loved nicking people. And and are, we, are you on your own when you're doing this? You know, like when you're trying to find these people to nick, what are you doing, just like walking walking around the estate, you know, finding somebody who looks like they're up to no good or are you part of a team? Yeah, a lot of the time, back in the, in the late 70s, you would be sent out to patrol on foot on your own. And you learn an awful lot of people skills and you learn how hopefully not to get your head kicked in. You know, when you're challenging people in the dead of night, you're stopping two people. First of all, you're outnumbered, and so you learn those sort of skills. Of course, you had a radio, so you could get on the radio if you were in a bit of bother, but you didn't know how long it was going to be before that help turned up. Generally speaking, not very long. But And, and I think the public appreciated the fact that while they were sleeping in their beds... Myself and other colleagues would be out there on our own in the dead of night, walking the streets, armed just with a truncheon, a bit of wood, about a foot or so long, with a leather strap on the end of it. So no tasers, no incapacitating spray, certainly no guns or anything like that. And I think the public looked at us and they thought, yeah, they're a bit vulnerable, but they're still putting themselves out there. And I think that is why... At that time, we we had quite a, a decent level of trust and respect from the from the public because they knew we were doing a job they wouldn't want to do. 
I feel like you're talking a lot in the past tense. Is that because that's when when your job was, or or is that because it's changed over time now? And you're saying that now, you know, that those uh, PCs on the beat aren't doing the same kind of job, and they don't have the same respect from the public, etc. Both, you've nailed it. Yeah, it's exactly that. Yeah, I I am endeavouring to paint a picture of how it was, and then if we do contrast it to how it is now where neighbourhood policing, beat policing, community policing, call it whatever name the police want to give it, um, that has been sacrificed in recent years. Yeah, I mean, because I guess as a, as a member of the public, uh, you know, we, you know, again, it, I'm sure it's completely unfair to certain members of the force, but, you know, I guess you know, we, we feel that the ones out there that you ever do see patrolling, not that you do see many, are probably at the, you know, the very lower end of, you know, with, with little ability to want to do anything or to do anything and that, you know, and you, you just, you don't feel safe for the things that you're supposed to feel safe for. When do you see a lone police officer in a smart uniform patrolling the streets, walking the streets, engaging with members of the public? It, it all got binned off years ago. The police will say they had to do that because of budget cuts and also because of counter-terrorism work and they had to second a lot of people into that. But what they did was they just tore away neighbourhood policing. That was the first place they went to get extra officers from. So in doing that, they fundamentally undermined the importance of it and that is actually the real core for me, important part of policing because it's how the public engage with the police officer. That police officer they see on the street. Now, I know certain chiefs of police have, have vowed to bring it back, and I sincerely hope they do, and it is happening in, in some places. But generally speaking, if you see or hear the police these days, it'll be two of them in a car, sirens wailing, blue lights flashing as they go from one call to another call to yet another call. Well, look, let's get into the juicy stuff. Uh, tell us, uh, I mean, how did you go from, uh, from you know, from, from being the PC to moving on to uh, onto the on, onto the undercover work and getting involved with the organised crime? Yes, yeah, so I did four years at Peckham in uniform, well, six months in plain clothes. That was kind of like my detective apprenticeship. Then I went up on a detective selection board, was fortunate enough to pass that. Got posted to Kensington, the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea, don't you know, which was very different from Peckham in South London. Um, did my first, did my tour there as a detective, three and a half years, absolutely loved it. Really loved it. Loved being in the CID office, loved investigating crime, loved going out, kicking lots of doors in. Um, had, a, had a fantastic time, worked with some really great cops. And then my next ambition was to be a Scotland Yard detective. That's kind of the next step for an ambitious young lower ranking detective. What exactly is that? I mean, I know the name, but what, what is it in real terms? Well, Scotland Yard hosted all the major specialist squads. So, for example, the Flying Squad, um, that was a Scotland Yard squad, albeit offices were based in various parts of London. So from things like the Fraud Squad, Counterfeit Currency Squad, Specialist Surveillance Squads, all of these squads that were allowed to specialise on the serious crime of one form or another were essentially Scotland Yard squads. And I was fortunate enough to be approached to go on the Central Drug Squad. So this is now 1985. And of course, having worked at Kensington, I've seen at very close quarters the explosion of cocaine onto the streets. You know, this was really the time when, as long, uh, along with like AIDS, of course, that was the generation of AIDS, um, when the real powder explosion of coke onto the streets started to happen. Because prior to that, cocaine was the preserve of rock stars, the upper class who had the money and had the contacts, and the entertainment industry a bit more broadly. It certainly wasn't the drug that it is now of chippies, sparks, scaffolders, painters and decorators, basically everybody. Everyone is you dog, know, yeah. it, it was it was a narrow band of people having it in those days. And I saw the explosion of it. I could because see Because it was materially was more expensive then and harder to come across. Or? Yeah, and not so many people imported it. Um, it was just simply for a very narrow band of people. But of course, drug dealers are innovative 
They're always looking for new markets because they want to make more money. And so they started bringing more and more cocaine into the UK. And, and that is when that massive explosion happened. And of course, it hasn't slowed down or shown any sign of slowing down to this day. So I knew by going on that squad, we'd get more resources. Ronald Reagan was the president on the other side of the pond. He was banging on about drugs. His wife had, a, had the most unsuccessful PR campaign in the history of mankind. She started a campaign saying, just say no to drugs. Well, how did that work out, everybody, right? Everybody actually said yes, <laughs> and they still are. Um, so I knew what was coming, and um, and I thought, yeah, that'll be the squad where there'll be lots of overtime, we'll get lots of resources, we'll be in the spotlight. And so I was very happy to walk in there as a young uh, detective at the age of 25. You know, when I walked through the, the revolving doors there with my shoulders back and my chest puffed out and all that, I thought, right, this is where I want to be. And you were undercover? Yeah. Is, is that like a is that like a full time gig or or you know are you being sent on an undercover mission for a couple of weeks here or you know uh, I guess you know we only only think how to ask these questions based on what we see on telly, don't we? But um, yeah, how, yeah, how does it work when you turn up at work? Well, when I went up onto that squad, I had no knowledge of how they were doing it, and the very first undercover job I was a part of, I was part of an arrest team, so. Other cops had already been in undercover negotiating with the bad guys and they were buying a parcel of heroin and the trade was set for the car park of Regent's Park Zoo, London Zoo. And I was part of an arrest team. I was an authorised firearms officer. So I was laying on the top deck of the bus, right, laying on the floor with my radio, <coughs> my, my gun in my shoulder holster, ready for when the signal was given to debus off the bus and arrest the bad guys. That was the plan. However, it didn't quite work out like that. Because what had happened, there was two male cops and a female cop that had been working undercover. And unbeknown to me, during the negotiations with the bad guys, the bad guys had said to the woman officer, right, strip off, because we want to make sure you're not wearing a wire. Um, and her modesty got the better of her, and she refused to take her top and her bra off. So the bad guys thought, oh, well, these people are just a bunch of patsies. Because anybody who's a real drug dealer wouldn't have any compulsion about whipping her top and her bra off and showing that she wasn't carrying a wire. So the bad guys decided... Well, was she carrying a wire? Or no. You, oh, okay. No. So the bad guys decided to rob them instead of do a deal with them. So when the undercover cops rocked up in the car park of London Zoo and the driver wound the window down. That's how long ago it is. Who has a window wider now these days? No one, do they? He wound the window down, and the bad guy had a little, what was then a, a GIF bottle of, which used to carry lemon juice, but he'd filled it with ammonia, and he just sprayed ammonia into the eyes of the cop. So he starts screaming. They grabbed the keys, opened the boot, and grabbed the hold all with 70 grand of the commissioner's money in it and leg it. So as you can imagine, all hell broke loose. I scuttled off the bus, could see a geezer legging it in the distance, so I went after him. And of course, in those days, I was a lot slimmer and a lot faster on my feet. And I was closing down on him and shouting at him. And uh, he just put his hand in his pocket, turned around and levelled a 2-2 pistol at me. Well, at that point, I built up such head of steam that there was no way I was going to stop. You know what I mean? So I tried a pretty unsuccessful kind of sidestep. Either way, clattered into him. He went flying. The gun went flying. Right, you're nicked, pal. Um, and a couple of the others were nicked. But for quite some time, the 70 grand was missing and nobody could find it. What eventually happened was that somebody spoke to a woman in the zoo and she said, oh, I saw a man come running through here earlier and he threw a bag under a tarpaulin which was covering a skip over there. So obviously what the bad guy had done was dumped it in the skip, pulled the tarp back over it, and he probably thought, I'll come back and retrieve yeah. it later when the dust has settled. So that, that 70 grand was recovered. And as the detective inspector in charge of that operation said at the debrief that night, he said, today I discovered that adrenaline runs down your leg because he could have seen his career going down a swanee pretty swiftly. And it was that day I thought, I'll have a go at this undercover malarkey. You know what I mean? I've seen how they do it. So you, so you ask for the gig, do you? 
Well, it was very unscientific in those days. The undercover unit hadn't been set up. That was still some years away. Uh, although there was a lot of undercover work being done, it was all very unofficial on an ad hoc kind of basis. We didn't have a central place to go to to get false driving licenses, passports, birth certificates, travel documents, all that kind of stuff. We just flew by the seat of our pants, basically. But yeah, a couple of days after that Regent's Park job, we're in in the office and the DI comes strutting down the office, says to the team, an undercover job has come in. Anybody want to go at it? Well, my hand went up like I'm a four-year-old at primary school, you know, who knows the answer to a teacher's question. And I said, yeah, right, I'll have a go at that. And um, and so began over a decade of working undercover. And what was that first gig? Oh, it was buying a half a kilo of cocaine off some South American drug dealer. You make it sound like popping down the shop for a can of coke. Well, yeah. I guess it gets like that, right? No, it doesn't. No, thank you for pointing that out. It doesn't because it's always, quite frankly, terrifying. But you, you learn how to control your ad- adrenaline. And because there is so much adrenaline, I mean... My peripheral vision was absolutely astonishing. I could be sitting there like I'm sitting here now, talking to you, and you, if you were the bad guy, would think you've got my full attention, but I know who's coming in that door over there. I know who's going out of that door over there. I know everything that's going on around me because the adrenaline has got me heightened to such a level, but what I have to do is control that adrenaline so my hands are not shaking. You know, and my heart isn't palpitating. So I'm looking as cool as a cucumber. But I know exactly who's over there. Of course, and I've got to know who's over there because I'm wondering whether you've got a spot to come in, in there or not. And they invariably did. And and is that a skill that, uh, I mean, they specifically set out to teach you in the police? Is it something that was natural to you? Well, after we'd set up the... The, the, the unit, which was SO10, and what happened when that unit was set up. And there was a need for it, so we could get the documents, so we could centralise the expertise. And I'd been doing it for a couple of years by then. And what happened was the 12 of us with the most experience developed the course. We ran the course as a sort of, as a trial run to see what training worked, how we could tweak it, what would be better, what we could ditch. And then... We had a we we then played a part in the future selection and training of undercover cops after that. So it did become formalised. But up until that, we just made it up as we went along. And because I'd been a bit of an oiky youth, and because I'd come across a lot of criminals in Peckham and had arrested a lot and knew a lot about criminality, they were all things that I took a little bit from here, a little bit from there, a little bit from there, and they helped me in my undercover persona. So tell me, I mean, and I guess, again, I only ask these questions in this way because because it's what we think of seeing it on TV. So so when when you're undercover, how long do you go for? Like you said, your first job, for example, was, was, buy, was buying the half a kilo of cocaine or whatever. But do you ever go on, you know, one-week missions to... to butter someone up before you make the buy or do you go on five years living because I mean I, I think about for example what's it Donnie Brasco or something yeah. like that where I mean he's like literally I mean there must have been months and months and months of prep to just get him into that circle before he got into that circle then he's undercover for years and years and years I mean do we have both both things almost all of the above yeah there was never a template you could lay over any undercover operation. I could quite literally get into the office eight o'clock one morning, somebody say, an informant's, you know, propped his head up last night, wants to introduce somebody, and 10 or 12 hours later, that job could all be boxed and coxed, you know, and it might be a significant seizure of drugs or guns or counterfeit currency or stolen lorry load or whatever it might be. Other jobs would take days weeks and months and would but you it be all run- depended on the, on the structure of the job who we were going up against and what we thought was the best way to capture would you be running more than one job at once yes sometimes but that was pretty unwise well because I, I mean then the next part of my question was going to be I mean <laughs> I guess it depends on your geographic area. It may have been easier in the 80s. I mean, nowadays with the social media or whatever, I mean, you know, you can't go anywhere without being recognised by someone about something. I mean, once you've kind of gone undercover, do you not almost need to keep that persona for the rest of your life? Not the rest of your life, but, you know, I don't know, if you are if you go and play the character Matt Haycox, you know, the, the, the whatever, the local drug dealer, then 
surely no matter what town in England you go to, you got you're all kind of pissing in the same pond, aren't you? And someone's going to know and come across you when you when you rock up as Mark Southern two years later. You must always be sweating that you're going to get caught. Matt, you're not the local drug dealer, are you? Can we no, just no, no, no. That? We're going to edit that bit out afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. I, I just thought I'd ask. Um, no, I don't it, think I've said that, did I? I, 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 think, I think I said you played the part of Matt Haycock who's going after a local drug dealer. <laughs> you're going to be worried now. <laughs> it was horses for courses, and what I always used to tell people was play a part that is as close to your true personality as you possibly can. And and bosses used to say to me, if I sometimes I'd get invited up to see the commissioner or the assistant commissioner to be awarded a certificate and all that, which is very nice. And you get cute cumber sandwiches, which were less nice. And and sometimes these bosses would say to you, Peter, how do you manage to do operation after operation after operation in your undercover role and not be compromised? And I'd say to him, well, this is the scale and the size of the industry that I'm talking about. You know, this is what we're up against. It's a vast industry. There are thousands upon thousands of people involved in it, in the drug dealing industry. And so as long as I'm careful to make sure that I'm not going up against the gang that I've been up against before. I can carry on doing it, and I did for over a decade. And if my undercover career hadn't all gone belly up like it did eventually, um, I possibly would have done it for a, a lot longer. But, yeah, stick to what you know. I always used to say to the, 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 the other cops when we were training them, stick to what you know, because I could never have portrayed the role of somebody educated in fine art who went to Eton you know, and he's looking to buy a Rembrandt, for example. All I could basically play was the role of a South London oik, because that's who I am, um, and that's the role I can play. You tinker about with it a little bit, obviously, but, uh, yeah, be who you are. And when it got to the end, ready to make an arrest, would you make the arrest, or would you you, you disappear and you, you know, so I guess your worst case scenario in the future is someone knew you as Steve last week and you called... John, two months later, it was never known that you were Steve the Copper. You were just yeah. Steve who might have changed his name for another reason. Yeah, I was usually having it on my dancers and legging it away from the scene as the arrest team came out from all manner of places where they'd been hidden and, and arrested the bad guys. And a lot of the time that went swimmingly well. On one notable occasion, it wasn't so great. Uh, a, a young guy who was aspiring to be an undercover cop had been pestering me and pestering me. And he was going, please, Blex, can I come out as your driver on the job? Please, 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 please. And he nagged me freaking uphill and down daily, he did. And eventually I caved in and let him come out uh, on a job as my driver. And I'm buying a parcel of pills. I don't know, I'm buying like 20, 30,000 ecstasy pills on this job from uh, a load of Irish fellas up in North London. And I've got this guy who's driving a car, and he's a big old lumpy motor. He's a BM or something, or a, you know, well, big old, big old car. And he's the driver. And so I'm, I'm sitting in the, I'm, I'm dealing with this negotiation, right, with the, with this little fella, who was jumpy and jumpy and nervous as heck and all that kind of stuff. And eventually, it gets to the point where I've shown him the money, he's shown me the parcel, I've taken control of the parcel, but he wants the money. Right Now, I've given the signal for the arrest team to come in and nothing's happened, right? And so I'm at the back of the car with this guy who quite rightly wants to get his hands on the money and take the money and clear off with it. And I can't quite allow that to happen. Finally, the arrest team did do their thing and in a moment of panic, this inexperienced bloke who's pestered me to work undercover forever and a day hits the accelerator, travels about a yard, top whack, slams the brakes on, and of course, because I'm in the boot, trying to keep hold of the bag with the money in it, <laughs> the boot slams straight down on my head, right? Splits my head open, right? The little geezer finally gets nicked, money's in the boot, my job's done, I better leg it. So I'm running up the road, and of course, with a head wound, when you're running, running too fast. what happens? <laughs> pump, 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 right? And his claret spurting out my head. One of the surveillance teams has seen me running up the road, right, pumping out claret. 
And, of course, they've got on the radio and there's all a big panic, mad scream up, like, you know, they think I'm going to bleed to death or something. Anyway, I eventually sort of, you know, ran out of breath, put my hand over my head, tried to stop the bleeding. Somebody came round, picked me up, took me to hospital. I had about half a dozen stitches and I was sort of right as rain and back at work the following day. Needless to say, I never worked undercover with that bloke again. <laughs> that was his first and last job with me. I feel like I've got hundreds of almost like a, you know, school schoolboy type questions that I can ask now from uh, from all of the uh, TV and stuff we've watched over the years. But you know, so I mean, you talk about going back to work the next day or, or whatever. I mean, have you been on yourself or other people ever on jobs where they're so long term you just you're not popping in the police station every day to check? I mean, you're literally just living undercover so again you're told to infiltrate Matt and you just I don't know you come and meet me in the pub and then you just come and live in Leeds for weeks and weeks yeah. on end and you're getting pissed I mean what are you doing you're getting pissed with me you're shagging birds I mean you, you, you're you allowed to do whatever you want not whatever you want but what you've got to remember is that whatever you do you might end up having to justify your actions at number one court in the old Bailey and that's what I always used to say to people you know, if you undercover cops when, when we're training them, if you feel like you're forced into a corner and you've got to take that line of Charlie or you've got to smoke that joint or you feel you have to get into bed with that person, just remember, you're going to be in a witness box. At number one called the highest criminal court in the old Bailey. And the, and the media will be there to report on your every word. So... Whatever you're going to do, you better be able to justify it, or else you're going to get shredded. And is it? But is it not a simple justification that you've asked me to be undercover with one of the most dangerous people in the world? I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to take a line of gear. I'm gonna have to shag a brass or whatever it is. Otherwise, it just looks completely out of character. The esteemed Malod, who's sitting like as the trial judge, has probably never been in a boozer with a terrifying hoodlum and felt that he's got a hoover up a line of Charlie or two, right? <laughs> Likewise, the university-educated barristers have never been in those kind of situations. And, of course, all they want to do is sow a seed of doubt in the jury's mind that you are not a witness of truth. And if they can do that, they've done their job and they'll secure an acquittal for their client. So, yes... And, and you you package it up really well, the practicalities of it, the danger of it, the situation you find yourself in. But I also used to say to the uh, trainees, when you're negotiating with these people, you really don't want to be off your nut on Charlie, on, on dope or what, whatever else it is. You don't want to be drunk because you need your wits about you. So whenever possible, don't do it. Don't take it. Make your reasons. Give an excuse if you've got to. Make sure it's legitimate. You can carry it off and it's believable. But don't do it. A lot of the time, you know, when we're sitting around and negotiating and people have pull out a, a, a lump of dope, for example, right, and they want to sit down and have a joint, you know, and understand modern jazz and eat four boxes of Maltesers, right? So, so you're sitting there... And I would, because I practised, I practised making joints, like, continually and racking up lines of powder. And these were ideas that I would give to the trainee undercover, undercover cops. If a geezer sitting over the other side of the table who I'm negotiating with pulls out a lump of resin, for example, it was predominantly resin in those days, there was bits of herbal and that, but say he pulls out a lump of resin and he's got a packet of skins, or I might have a packet of skins. I'd always carry a packet of skins, you know what I mean? I mean, cigarette papers. Just So So I'll, I'll grab his bit of gear, his bit of dope, grab his uh, grab his cigarette papers, his virulins, his skins, you know, and I'll pull a fag out, and I will build a joint, right? And if I know I've, I've been forced into a corner now, and I'm going to have to have a, a, a tug on this joint with him, well, I'm making the joint. So what I do is I backload it. In other words, at the front of the joint, which is the bit that's going to get sparked up and smoked first, I don't put any cannabis, right? But he doesn't know that. He can't see that because I'm disguising it with my fingers the way I'm doing it. So the first centimetre has not got any dope in it. And I go, I built it, I'm sparking it, right? 
I don't mind being perceived as somebody with, you know, not very good joint smoking manners, right? I'm here to do a deal, like, and I'm undercover cop and I want to get out of this gaff alive. So I'll say, I built it, I'm sparking it, right? And I'll spark it up and I'll have a couple of big couple of tugs on it, you know what I mean? Huge, great lungfuls. But all I'm smoking is tobacco because that's what I put at the front of the joint. All right, there might be a bit of residual as, as the heat travels down the joint through the other smoke, but it's not burning it, you know. I'm just banging on the front of it and then I just hand it round. Job done. I've not smoked a joint to all intents and purposes. He thinks I have. You know, I've also built a good joint. I mean, I could build a three skin, a five skin, a seven skin. I could build you a joint like a baby's arm, you know, like a massive great lardy doll cigar. <laughs> You know, because it was part of my job. I was working undercover. I was going to be professional and know what I was doing. Likewise with cocaine. If the same sort of geezer pulls out a rapper Charlie and we're all going to have a line, well, I go, oh, I can't stand like being on gear when I'm driving and I've got the car outside, but I'll rack up the lines and I'll go, you know, get a credit card out, get one of the old phone cards out, chop, 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 chop. Right? You're easy. Your name's Matt, okay? So I would put your lines in an M. I'd carve an M, right? It was a bit more difficult if somebody's name was Steve and, you're, and you've got to make an S, right, out of the cocaine. <laughs> but I did because I practised it, right? Easy if it's a T for Terry, all of that. And people would go, I've never seen it put out like that before. And all their suspicions that they might harbour about you, you know, are you an undercover cop? Are you the real deal? They all go when you do little things like that. And they're utterly convinced because they know you know your way around a bit of gear and you've done something that they've never seen before. I mean, you know, you say, obviously, you, you put people's um, suspicions at rest. I mean, how often are criminals conscious of people being undercover cops? Oh, they're totally paranoid. You know, back in the day, they were all paranoid as hell. Some of them because they're on gear, but others because they do not want to get a lengthy jail term wrapped around them. You know, and back in those days, you get nicked with a kilo of cocaine, you're going to get eight or ten just for one kilo. You know, and if you get nicked for four or five kilos, you're getting twelves and fourteens. And people didn't want that sort of bird wrap around them. So they were double, double kind of suspicious and paranoid and all of that. So you have to win their, win their friendship to a certain extent, you know, to put their minds at, at, at mm -hmm. ease. Um, and however you did that, yeah, crack on and do it. Do you get undercover police in in jails? Like, like as in, do, you, do people go and pretend to be criminals in there? Like again, stuff you see on the telly. But it has happened. It's an incredibly high risk thing to do. I never did it. It's easier to get an undercover cop into the cell in a police station. Certainly, it was back in the day. I don't know if it's a current tactic or not. I suspect in modern policing. Probably not. Probably deemed as too high risk, especially putting an undercover cop in a jail. Because if they get something wrong and they get undiscovered, it's a very complex procedure to extract them from that jail, by which time it might be too late. And again, hy hypothetically, then, if, it, if it's not happening, because the follow-up question was going to be, how do you get paid in this world? Like, I mean, obviously, you've got your money as an under undercover copper, but if you had to go and do a gig like being in jail, I mean, it's effectively, a tw you got, you're at work 24-7 in the most horrendous fucking circumstances ever. I mean, would there be more money for something like that, or is it just for the love of the game? I suspect you'd have a very interesting overtime negotiation with the officer in charge right. of that operation. You know, <laughs> And, um, you certainly wouldn't get paid for 24 hours a day. I'm, I'm pretty sure that that wouldn't happen. Yeah, but we we were generally speaking because we were specialists, because the people that wanted us to go and do their jobs, you know, once you'd got a reputation and people knew you were quite competent at doing it, your reputation would spread throughout the country and further afield. So I was forever disappearing off here, there and everywhere and doing operations for different squads, different forces, sometimes different countries. And you just negotiate some kind of deal with, with the bosses to what you were going to get paid. But needless to say, I don't have a yacht. Were there many stories of of undercover people who kind of, you know, Cross, cross the line. I mean, I guess you spent you spend so much time in that world that you know maybe sometimes sometimes you do blur the lines between what what's what's right and wrong, and it's gone it's gone past you know just taking a few lines when maybe you shouldn't have taken a few lines, and you end up being a bit bent. It's a matter of great pride that, with regards to the SO10 unit, 
Yes, they got heavily criticised on one operation, but they basically did that at the behest of a criminal psychologist. But SO10 as a unit was never mired in any kind of corruption scandal whatsoever. And it's a matter of great pride for me because I worked with some brilliant men and women on that unit. Really, really brilliant, clever, diverse, every colour, race and creed you can imagine. Some astonishingly brilliant women. And between us and with the assistance of our colleagues that did the investigations, the surveillance, the arrests, we put hundreds of people away for thousands and thousands of years. And you, you mentioned police corruption. I mean, that was going to be a bit of a follow-up question as well. I mean, you know, we've talked uh, up to now about, I guess, how as the public, you know, we get get a lot of our, uh, our police questions from from the telly. And one of my personal favourite TV shows is is uh, is Line of Duty, where I guess we get um, we get both undercover police and police corruption. I know, obviously, most things on TV are sensationalised to a degree, but I mean, you know, how how possible or prevalent is is that level of police corruption? Corruption. I mean, I, I mean, are there any stories that have ever come out, or is there much that goes on that you know you can't talk about? Police corruption will always be there, sadly, and corruption comes in many different forms. Back in my day, a lot of corrupt officers were caught because they were fabricating evidence, and that was called noble cause corruption. You know, nothing fucking noble about fitting someone up. So someone, so, someone who you know is dirty anyway, but you can't get them for what they've yeah. done. So you, fit so them you on attribute else. a false confession to them. Yeah. You know, or somebody goes through the door with what what corrupt cops used to call a happy bag. So that would be a bag with a sawn-off shotgun, a balaclava, a pair of gloves, and this, that, and the other. And they plant that in their car or plant it in their bedroom. That kind of stuff. Doesn't sound and that very was happy. Good. And that say doesn't sound very happy. No, no, exactly, <laughs> exactly. It's, it's odd. Same as it's odd to call it noble cause yeah. corruption. Uh, nothing noble in it whatsoever. Um, and then, of course, there's the self gain corruption, where people steal drugs or money for their own gain and all that kind of stuff. And there's the corruption where people use their power and their influence. Unfortunately, and we've seen a lot of these cases lately, where they use it to kind of coerce victims of crime in, into having sexual relations with them. And, and so it comes in many different forms. But I guess the most interesting corruption story of, that I personally was ever a, a part of was when I got a phone call from a young detective that I knew because I'd worked with him elsewhere. He was on a, a specialist squad and he rang me one day and he was in a dreadful state. You know, you could tell by his voice and the way he spoke and he was, he, he said, Plex, Plex, we've got to have a meet. We've got to have a meet. Please, please, please. Got to have a meet. And I knew it was urgent. So I went off and met him and he said, and we, and we met in a pub. All detectives in those days met in pubs. We met in a pub and he said, Plex, I've been out of order. I've been a fool. He said, but I didn't ever think it would come to this. And I said, all right, stop talking in riddles and tell me what's happened. He said, well, we went out on an operation and we stole £200,000 cash off a drug dealer. He said, on our team, there was like nine of us that were in the inner sanctum. So this was nine corrupt detectives within a team of about 15 detectives. So the others on the outside were never made privy to any of the corruption that went on within the inner sanctum. He said, so we've nicked this 200 grand and we've had a divvy up between us. But one of the corrupt cops was going out with one of the straight cops. So one of the nine was going out with one of the 15. Mm -hmm. right? And what he did was divided up his £20,000 with his girlfriend cop. Now, all of a sudden, that has potentially put the nine or ten corrupt cops at risk because she's just been bled into being corrupt because her partner's given her ten grand readies. So, of course, the inner corrupt sanctum were livid about this because suddenly a weak link had been created. You know, and if she'd got her 10 grand and gone, right, I'm going straight to the complaints department and I'm going to tell them everything that's going on, 
The others would have all got nicked and gone to jail, you know, for some considerable time. So he said, um, and it, it gets worse. He says, um, the inner sanctum have decided that because she's a weak link, they're going to murder her. I said, you serious? He said, yeah. I said, well, what about the boyfriend? I said, well, he ain't going to know until it's too late. Well, this is clearly a dreadful, shameful, scandalous situation getting potentially a whole lot worse. And the, the fellow was beside him. So he said, I know I've done wrong. I know I've been stupid. I just, you know, I just don't know what to do. I, I, I don't want to have her blood on my hands. And I said, all right, leave it with me. So I went off and had a think about it. What I will say is that I didn't go down the official route. In other words, I didn't go straight to the complaints department. I didn't go to the complaints department at any point, and I'll accept any criticism anybody wants to level at me for that. What I will say, however, before anybody jumps on social media to have a pop at me, is that that woman police officer did not die, so that's very much a positive. And at some later stage, certain detectives from that squad went to jail for so, unconnected matters. They found a happy bag. They found a happy bag in their uh, downstairs toilet. So, you know, I'll leave it at that. So there you go. Yeah, yeah. Um, unfortunately, as long as the police is populated by people, mm. there will be corruption. I mean, but the levels of wrongdoing we're seeing in the police now is absolutely scandalous. It's way, way, way beyond anything that ever happened in my day in terms of numbers and the seriousness of it. You know, with people, police officers murdering entirely innocent, beautiful women, kidnapping, raping them and murdering them. And then another police officer, I'm not even going to mention their names because they're such dirty, filthy, monstrous scumbags, you know, being convicted of 60, 80 sex offences, many of them rapes, and so many other cases. There are crooked police officers appearing in court every week, and it's scandalous. Policing has really hit the depths, and no wonder the public don't trust the police. It's in crisis. It's in a dreadful state. I mean, when these police are, are obviously you know, getting arrested, going, going to trial and getting presumably getting done, I mean, I, I, I would imagine they're not having a fun time on the inside as well. No, but they've probably got a whole bloody prison to themselves by now. There's so many of them. <laughs> really? You know, there are so many. Obviously, I'm a very keen follower and watcher of crime and policing because it's my job to comment in the media, as I do on a, on a very regular basis, about crime and policing. So I'm across all of these cases. And it's absolutely scandalous. The the chiefs of police telling us they're doing things about it and, well, let's hope they do, but by crikey have they got a job on their hands. But And is it worse now than it was back in your time or is it just that, uh, you know, think things are more, more visible now or there's more whistleblowers now on most social media, whatever it may be? No, it's worse. Just look at the numbers. I mean, there was a former commissioner of the police called Paul Condon, and to call him average would be really doing him a favour. But he stood up once upon a time and said there were 250 corrupt detectives in the Met Police some years ago. How big's the force? Uh, oh, nearer 30,000 than 20,000, I think. But, however, last week or the week before, they said there's going to be 2,000 police officers drummed out of policing across the board. So not just in the Met, yeah. but the Met, the Met uh, guesstimate was 500. So if either of those figures stack up, it's at least twice as bad as it used to be, you know, given regard to some fluctuation in the police officer numbers. Um, so the problem is much, much worse. The police only have themselves to blame in many regards because the vetting wasn't good enough and they let people with criminal convictions join the police and they also let people who were entirely unsuitable join the police. So some of it is of their own making. And the people I feel really sorry for, primarily, of course, the victims of the dreadful crimes these so-called police officers commit. But I really feel sorry for the good cops. They're the ones I feel sorry for because I would not want to work alongside a police officer who had come into the police with a criminal conviction, for example. And I'll tell you one of the many reasons why not. You imagine you've worked on a long, complex case 
You've arrested the bad guys. They've been charged. You're in court. You go into the witness box at the Old Bailey and you give your evidence. And you are robustly cross-examined. But because you're a witness of truth, you stick to what you've said because that is the truth and you've done your job. Then your colleague gets into the witness box. First and question. what is the first yeah. question? You know it, Matt. Yeah. First question from defence counsel. Officer, do you have any criminal convictions? Yes. I mean, what it, it makes it so easy for the defence counsel to just then go to the jury and say, members of the jury, this man or woman has a conviction for dishonesty or a sex offence or whatever it might be, are you going to believe their testimony? And are they, are they letting them in because they're not vetting them properly or, or, or is it not, is it part of part of the new world wokeness that they, they've got to give everyone a chance? Both. What, what, so, so it's not it's not a prerequisite of being a police officer that you must not have a conviction? It hasn't been, but certainly the Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, Sir Mark Rowley, has heavily indicated that he's going to turn the tide on that and that only people that are suitable police officers become police officers, which bonkers. really isn't too Absolutely much to bonkers, ask, isn't it? it? <laughs> yeah. Utter, utter nonsense. But you see, so many senior police officers these days you know, come from this period of evolution around about the time that Tony Blair said education, education, education. And some of these aspiring, ambitious, greasy pole climbers who all think that frontline policing is a bit beneath them, you know what I mean? They don't like rolling around on the pavements with robbers and burglars. That's all a bit grubby for these people who just want to climb that pole and sit behind a bloody desk all day. Right, so they all trotted off to university and got their degrees and come back police to police him, with their heads full of pseudo intellectual claptrap, which had very little relevance to police him. It might help them manage a budget, and that's what most of them do. Once you get beyond superintendent, you get the chief superintendent and that kind of level, they manage budgets. Well, why do we need senior police officer manage a budget? Get a civilian in on a fraction of the cost who's actually got experience in accounting and the like, you know. Oh, makes my frigging blood boil. But anyway, yeah, so they all came back to policing and that's why now so much of policing from the senior le leadership downwards is fluffy, is woke, is liberal and is not what the public want out of their police service. It's nonsense. It won't be long till we get a transgender copper, will it? Oh, I'm sure there, there are now. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there is and I'm sure, you know, if they're a good cop, I don't give a damn, you know, what they call themselves or what their pronouns are. Mine are bloke and geezer, by the way. Officer. Right? Officer. You know, I don't care. If they're a good, dedicated public servant and they like nicking people and they like looking after victims and they know how to gather evidence, they know how to keep the streets safe, I don't give a damn who they are, what bits they've got or not got or what they call themselves. I just want it to be a dedicated and I mean dedicated, committed public servant who hates bad guys and loves locking them up. Well, I mean, obviously, every kind of answer you've given shows your clear passion for uh, passion for policing. Um, but um, it, it's been obviously twenty odd years since you're in it because because of the uh, the downfall of your career. Just, um, I mean, I could ask you questions all day long about un un under undercover policing. I think I could literally sit with <laughs> sit with you for days on end. But uh, t you know, tell tell me tell me how it ended and what went wrong. Together with uh, an undercover colleague from what was then called Customs and Excise, um, we infiltrated a bunch of extremely well-connected villains who were offering vast quantities of heroin for sale. And they said they could supply it on a regular basis. And if we couldn't pay them in money, they were willing to accept consignments of guns or explosives or missiles as payment. So you can probably get what their sort of day job was. They were, they were connected to terrorism. We negotiated with them. <clears throat> I was sort of, you know, the, the oiky bloke who was going to deal with the drugs and, you know, run the, the contraband about and all that stuff. And this long, complex, multi-agency operation, which involved the Drug Enforcement Agency from America, the FBI, the Regional Crime Squad, Customs and Excise, Garda Shikana, the Irish Police and more, this complicated operation was all to come to a crescendo when the drugs were going to be delivered to me at a hotel at Gatwick 
Gatwick Airport. So that day, we had a big briefing in the morning. I was to receive the drugs. Another one of the bad guys was going to be shown hundreds of thousands of pounds in safety deposit lockups in boxes in, in central London. And true to form, because we'd been very convincing during the negotiations, they did think we were proper pucker bad guys. A man rocked up at Gatwick Airport with an extremely heavy holder with 15 kilos of high-grade heroin, divided into 30 half kilo sort of egg-shaped parcels, basically. He rocks up. We go to the hotel room, which, unbeknown to him, is already wired for audio and video. And we sit down, and for about the next four hours, I weigh and test every package. Um, and when I say test, it was a bit unscientific, but I knew my gear. So what I would do with a standing knife was make a small slit in each half kilo package with the tip of the standing knife, put a little bit of the heroin on a piece of silver foil, hold the silver foil in front of me and away from me, and then burn it with a cigarette lighter afterwards. <clears throat> so the fumes would go off. You know, the old chasing the dragon expression, if I was a heroin addict, you would hoover those fumes up and inhale them, you know, with a rolled up 10 pound note or whatever. After that's done, I, by way of my very unscientific, but also pretty good testing, would look at the burnt residue on the silver foil. The more burnt residue on the foil, the more sugars or mixing agents, cutting agents were on the drug. The cleaner the foil, the better the gear. This was all very good gear. But because I wanted to show that I was a consummate professional and because all those miles away in London where the money was being shown and there were complex surveillance operations going on and all of that, I wanted to buy some time for them. So I did every parcel, 30 of them. And then, of course, I'd have to retake them up and all that. And it took about four hours. I was having a banging headache at the end of it because, of course, it was inevitable that some I would have inhaled. But nonetheless, job done, all successful. Me and the little fella going to go down to the hotel bar and celebrate the start of a long, fruitful and profitable relationship. Until we got to the lift lobby, that was, an armed police jumped out, slammed us to the floor, handcuffed us and dragged us off. That you were expecting? Yes, yeah. yeah. But typical, even though I'd been at the briefing in the morning with the firearms officers and I told them that I was one of theirs and they'd seen me and they'd heard me talk at the briefing and I said, so please, when his head is facing away from mine, you can be a little gentler with me because I am actually a police officer. But no, those numbskull frigging <laughs> people slammed me into the ground just as hard and slammed the handcuffs on just as tight and bruised me as much as they bruised him. Thank you very much, officers. So other arrests were made. number of people are remanded into prison and... So the wheels. Where do you get taken at that point? Do you get do you get taken off to to the yeah. local police station and escape at the back? Or no, I, I got taken off elsewhere and the handcuffs were taken off and then I got driven off for a debrief somewhere and all that sort of stuff. And a lot of people, senior police people, wanted to buy me a drink because at the time that was the biggest landside seizure of heroin in the UK ever. I mean, I know it's been dwarfed now, you know, many many times over, but at the time it was the biggest landside seizure of heroin in the UK. So, I'm sorry, I interrupt your story anyway. No, no, no. So I had to write up my evidence, of course, and, you know, exhibit labels, etc., to give to officers, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. And then, then people took me for quite a few drinks. Anyway, what happened was I knew there was some kind of threat against me uh, by the bad guys because what had happened, they sort of rocked up in the dock as part of the committal procedure to go to the old Bailey. And, of course, they're looking round in the dock going, where's that long-haired long -haired bloke from South London called Peter? Ah, maybe he's an undercover cop. So then they worked on the theory that if they killed me, they'd kill the evidence. And to a certain degree, they were right. But, of course, they weren't going to fire me. You know, they didn't know... Who, what my surname was or anything like that, you know, then it, 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 they wouldn't have found me. So, and being threatened was part of, you know, went with, went with the job. It was part of, part of the territory, really. Anyway, what happened was 
a few weeks or months later, I'm driving home from work. Actually, I finished early. So I'm going to go to the pub and have a drink. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy about that. Driving to the boozer, mobile phone rings, and it's one of the bosses at the yard, and he says, Blex, don't go home. And I said, oh, right, why is that? He said, I can't tell you. He said, but be in here at Scotland Yard, nine o'clock tomorrow morning. I was like, right, okay. He said, um, who do you live with? I said, my girlfriend. He said, well, get her to go to your flat and pack an overnight bag, but that's all, and then move into a hotel tonight using one of your false identities, one of my undercover identities, and make sure you're here tomorrow. And there was a hint of panic in his voice. And I went, right, okay. Met my girlfriend, booked in a hotel, smashed the granny out of the minibar that night, thinking like, you know, what the heck's going the missus. on? <laughs> <laughs> a bit of both. <laughs> thinking, thinking what's going on. And of course, I turned up at eight o'clock the following morning, not nine o'clock, you know what I mean? I'm a detective. And there was my mate ready to meet me. And in his hands, he had a report. It was called a briefing note. And he said, have you seen this? I said, no, no idea. Never seen it before. He said, right, come with me. He locked me in the photocopy room, right, with this report. He said, read that and stick that copy in your pocket because you're going to need it. Well, what I then read was a, a, it was called a briefing note from Operation Zulu Cricket. And it's available on my website, by the way, peterblexley.com. And this was just quite astonishing for me to read for the first time. It detailed the level of the threat, you know, how much I was in danger. But the report had my real name in it, right? Now, when you work undercover, any report should only have your undercover number in it. It should never have your real name in it for obvious blooming reasons. Anyway, my name features in this, like, on every page, you know, about the death threat and... You know, about the assassin. From the people to do with the heroin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah for about the assassination that they're going to kill me and all this game and blah, 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 blah. And it's got my real name in it. And the astonishing thing is, I'm told that report has been stolen from an unmarked police car. So now it could be in possession of the bad guys. So there's a pre-existing plot to kill me, married up with this report that's got my real name in it, suddenly I'm very easy to find because I've got a very unusual surname. There's only about 14 Blexes in the UK and I've fathered most of them. Well, no, 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 no only three, <laughs> right? Only three, honestly, right? So now the enormity of the situation is beginning to dawn on me. And then there was a series of meetings all day long. I floated around the yard. Edless chickens were running about left, right and centre. Didn't really have a clue what they were doing. And in the end, by the close of play that day, it had been decided that I had to abandon my home, abandon my life, my identity, abandon everything that was close to me and hurriedly go into the witness protection programme. Without your missus? No, she came with me. She, she had the choice. Oh, yeah, they graciously said to me, you know, you can offer your girlfriend the choice. Oh, thank you very much, can I? Right, so this job now wants to decree like who I'm going to live with or not. I mean, she did come with me. Eternal credit to her for that. But, sadly, I had two years in the Witness Protection Programme. Where do you... Oh, sorry, I'm interrupting on the way, but where, where do you go for that? Is it like, I don't know, if you were in London for your job, did they send you to Manchester or something? Or? No, I only went a few miles from my home, but you know how big London is and how anonymous you can be in a city like that. They gave me a few options, none of which were very desirable or palatable, but I, in the end, I, I, I had to take one. The place was an absolute dump. So I uh, I negotiated with them to get a few quid to bring it up to a habitable standard. And they still wanted me to work, bizarrely. I still had to work undercover. So like on any given day, I could be three different people. <laughs> you know, I wake up in this hideout, right? Go and check the car to make sure no one's put a bomb under it. From the and during the car journey from this hideout to work, I could be Peter Blexley, put on whatever radio station I want, be myself for an hour, get to work, and the boss would say, Blex, another undercover job come in. So I'd go out and, you know, do that undercover job. And of course, when I woke up in that hideout, I was in the name of, you know, the the, the false name that I had to live in. So one day, three different people. And this went on day after day after day. And of course, I was conspiracy theorising as to, well, why was my name in that report? And how did it get taken out of police premises? And why did it go in an unmarked car? And how come that car got broken into? And the driver of that bloody car, the author of the report, 
believe it or not, I later found out, claimed that he had his watch stolen out of the glove box. Because you know how it is, before you go to the supermarket, you just take your watch off and stick it in the glove box, don't you? I mean, what a load of nonsense. And so I conspiracy theorised about all this, working undercover, this, that and the other, intolerable strain. Yes, I played a part in my own downfall because I drank too much and I smoked too much. You know, I was just trying to make sense out of all this. I self-medicated through booze. I really didn't help myself. And in the end, after just over a couple of years of living in this hideout, I had a catastrophic mental health breakdown. My girlfriend quite properly left me because I'd become an absolute monster. And I got put in a lock-in psychiatric ward for three and a half weeks. And that basically signalled the end of my undercover career. It was the beginning of the end of my police career. Albeit I tried to cling on for a bit, you know, once I'd got sort of better. But it didn't, you know, it was always doomed to failure, really. So in 1999, just, you know, not even 40, 39 years old, I get medically retired from the job. I'm on the scrap heap of life. I've got no education to fall back on, foolishly. No trade. I'm not a chippy or a Sparks or anything like that. I'm on the, the, the scrap heap of life. What the heck am I going to do? And if, I mean, I guess hypothetically, if if you hadn't have had the, the breakdown and hadn't have left the police in that way, how long does the, um, the witness protection last for? I and mean, at what point do they decide that you're safe? Nobody thought it out. That's just a brilliant question. Thank you. Nobody had thought it out. They all just knee-jerked. And I just had to go along with it because I was the subject of it. And, and I was just... I should have asked that question. But I didn't. You can imagine, you know, I've, I've, I've just been turfed out my flat the night before. You know, I am not thinking logically or strategically. Somebody at Scotland Yard who gets paid a shitload of money to be a senior police officer should have gone, take a breath. Let's think about this. But no. Knee jerk after knee jerk after knee jerk. Well, I guess as um, as, as traumatic as the as the end of it was, um, it then led on to the next adventure of your life, which is uh, which has been been far from dull for the last twenty years as well. <laughs> yes, thank you. Yeah, no, it's, it's not been dull, and it's been a lot more enjoyable than living in witness protection. Yeah, when I was contemplating what I was going to do, I thought, you know what, I think I've got a cracking book to write here. I really do. All the tales of working undercover and, and the such like. That was your idea? Yeah, yeah, my idea. And I was fortunate enough through a friend to get an introduction to a publisher eventually. And I sent him my synopsis. And very, very soon afterwards, he was on the phone saying, yeah, let's, let's do this book. I was threatened by police officers not to do it. You know, I was called on to meetings in pubs just so people could threaten me. Oh, as, in, as in threatened, threatened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you won't write this book. Yeah? Oh, really? Says who? You're not my sergeant anymore, pal. I'm not in the police anymore. Look, I don't have a warrant card. You can't tell me what to do. This book is going to be written and it's going to be published. No, it isn't. Oh, yeah, what are you going to do about it? Wait and see. Yeah, all right, I'll wait and see. So I stormed out, you know what I mean? Needless to say, they didn't chase me into the car park and put their hands up for a tear-up, did they? because they didn't have the bottle. Obviously, my street fighting days are long behind me and I couldn't condone violence in any way, shape or form. But I did used to be the Metropolitan Police Light Heavyweight Boxing representative and I could have turned him into a crowd, but he probably knew that, so he didn't follow me into the car park. Yeah, and The Gangbuster was published in 2001, I think it was. That's the name, The Gangbuster. Yeah, yeah, still available on Amazon and, and all that kind of stuff. Plug, plug, plug. Have you got an audio version? You've got the perfect yeah, yeah, voice yeah. for an audio yeah, version. Yeah, I've, I've recorded the audio version of all, my, of all my four books. Yeah, they're all out there. Thank you very much. Yeah, and it just opened doors. Suddenly, the media wanted me to go on the radio and the television and talk about crime and policing, and I did. And I still do to this day, remarkably, for which I'm extremely grateful. And uh, I owe a huge debt to John Blake, who published the book way back when, because it opened doors that I'm still walking through today. And as we said in the intro, where you have had a bit of time with The Hunted. Yes. What, what was what was that like? And how, how realistic is it? Channel 4's Hunted. Yes, I came on that when it was just a, an idea on a largely blank piece of paper. So I was there from the off. Very exciting times. First series, I was a deputy. Second series, I got promoted to chief. So I did three main shows as chief and two celeb versions of chief. 
met some wonderful people on the Hunters team, um, some of whom I'm still in contact with uh, and will be until I gasp my last. Had a brilliant time, um, bowed out when we caught all the fugitives on the main show in 2019, much to the annoyance of the fugitives, obviously, but also the production company. <laughs> Ah, well, did it cut see, the content? Cut the content short, did it? See, no, no, no. I just don't think that was their plan. I think they wanted somebody to win the hundred grand, but they didn't. And, see, and any particularly annoying celebs that you enjoyed catching? Oh, the celebs. Oh, well, so the celeb version always had a slightly lighter touch to it, you know, because it was for charity and uh, and that kind of stuff. It is a source of deep, deep shame that uh, I got done over by a Tory MP, Johnny Mercer. He he, he didn't get captured, but uh, you know, yeah, it was um, it was good fun while it lasted. There always comes a time when it is time to move on, and I knew that, and I think the show realised that as well. So we we parted our our ways, but I had a I had a good time. But predominantly for me, the buzz was the people on my team, the people that I worked with, the people on my team. They were great. And um, it, was, it was, yeah, it was good fun. Well, a couple more things I want to ask you ask you before we wrap up. And like I say, you know, it's hard to pick a last couple of things because uh, you know uh, we are going to have to do another one of these at some point in the future. But um, I mean, it's, it's a big it's a big talk at the moment around, I guess, you know, nanny states and and, and being uh, you know governments overreaching, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, how how true is that? You know, how how much are we being watched? Oh, not as much as the Chinese people are. That's for sure. I would imagine. With their facial recognition at every corner and all of that. Because fortunately, we don't live in a, we don't have an autocratic leader, uh, I would hope. And we enjoy many, many freedoms. CCTV was originally conceived as a crime prevention tool, you know, back in the sort of 60s when it first became a thing. And then again in the, the 90s, really exploded out onto our streets. So now we've got hundreds of millions of cameras and ring doorbell cameras and, and, and what it is now. Yeah, it was originally going to prevent crime. Well, it didn't for very long. And now it's an evidence gathering tool. That's what it's predominantly used as by law enforcement. Certainly they use it to, to gather evidence. We are a long, long way away from being something like China, we have checks and balances and an information commissioner, for example, and many other uh, establishments which will prevent us from living in an, an autocratic state, I'm very pleased to say. I'm proud of the fact that Britain is a flagship democracy, far from perfect, of course, and its police are a long way from perfect. But let's hope they take the steps that they need to or else they will simply become extinct. There are private security companies now that patrol streets, investigate crime, prosecute people, arrest people, prosecute people. They take them to court themselves. They do the job of the police, where the police Paid fail to do who? it. The local... The local residents, basically, or local businesses that chip together. And it's a price worth paying because the astonishing results that some of them have got and make these companies more profitable, these shops more profitable. Shoplifting has decreased hugely. Pickpocketing, crimes of violence, they're doing what the police should be doing. The police really need to reconnect with the nine principles of policing laid down by Sir Robert Peel in 1829. They're nearly 200 years old, but you know what? You can find them on the internet. Just, just type into your search engine, Robert Peel's principles of policing, and up they will come, and they are as apt, as relevant, and as apposite to society today as they were when he wrote them all those years ago. I mean, you talk about violence. I mean, you know, knife crime seem, seems to be something that's mentioned, you know, breakfast, lunch and dinner in, in uh, you know, in, in every piece of media nowadays. I mean, what, why why is that getting worse? And what, what, can we do to, what can we do to stop it? Or not so much what can we do to stop it, but, I mean, yeah, are, are, are the police adequately adequately equipped to deal with these kind of things? The reasons are complex as to why people take a knife out onto the street and there's many kind of potential factors. I mean, is it because it's easier to get than a gun? But then again, then we do well, gun yes. crime. Yeah, that, that, that is a reason, of course, but also these wicked, horrible knives that could be sourced on the internet. They need to uh, certainly regulate or tighten that up. But absent parents, for example, 
Some people say, oh, you can't say that. That's unfair. No, no. Kids need dads, right? End of story. I've got three. They've needed me. I've been there for them. I've got three contributing, very decent members of society as my boys, who I'm hugely proud of. Kids need dads. How old? Uh, 35, 22 and 21. Kids need dads. Even if the dad isn't there full time, he needs to be there at the weekend. He needs to some set some kind of example, either an example for the kid to follow or an example for the kid to not follow. At least he needs to be there and see him and hear him and be told he loves him and, and is loved by him and, and all of that. School, excluding kids from school, is a very easy way of allowing gang members to prey on them and get them in their clutches. You see the hoodlums that hang around outside pupil referral units, which is where excluded kids often get sent to. They're like vultures hovering. Poverty, is that a reason? I should think it is with some. Lack of community policing, yes. Lack of positive role models, yes. Childhood trauma, yes. But predominantly, it's the illegal drugs industry. That's what most of this knife crime is about. It's about people imposing their authority on their patch, on their business, on their trade in the illegal drugs industry. That is the cause of so much of it. Well, that kind of leads me on to what was going to be my last, my last question then, which was to say, uh, I mean, you talked about at the beginning of your career that you know cocaine was just was just starting, and now, I mean, to say it's everywhere is the understatement of the fucking century. I, yeah. I, I mean, you know, if, if you if you don't do it, if you don't know where it is, then you are the absolute minority. And I guess kind of, you know, cu- cu- coupled with that question, I mean, if, if I think about Leeds, for example, where I'm from, I could, you know, well, anywhere I could go, I could find find gear, gear yeah. on a Friday night, Saturday night, Tuesday night. I yeah. could, but then also, coupled to that, I could quite easily say they're... 10 very well-known drug dealers. They're two or three, you know, reasonably well-known armed robbers. You know, these are these are people who are just, you know, we know as part of the community that everyone knows what the fuck they're up to. I mean, we've been known, known it for 20 years. I mean, half of my mates will have been interacting or buying from them. Yep. What, what, why, why can't something be done about it? Why are they still there? If I, if I know it, why doesn't why doesn't the law deal with it? Yeah, because law enforcement don't have the resources. I suspect you know they're just not enough of them. But, but at, what, at what at what point does it become like? I mean, I'm, I'm not talking about guys who sell a wrap here and there. I mean, I'm talking yeah. about you know substantial you know, substantial yeah. criminals. People at the top the top end of that pyramid, you know, the whole yeah. drug pyramid, you know. So at the very bottom, you've got the hapless problematic users and the pyramid narrows. So at the top, you've got the kingpins. There's a solution to this. There's a solution, and I'm not promising that it's going to be easy. And it might not happen in my lifetime, but it will happen in my children's lifetimes. And that is the legalisation and regulation. Please don't separate those words. The legalisation and regulation of the entire illegal drugs industry. That is the only way we are going to be able to rip this industry from the vice-like grip of organised crime. It can be done. The drug law reform movement is gathering pace all the time. MPs are seeing the light, but not in the numbers that we need. It will happen. That's how we reduce the harm, reduce the violence, stop people like Ellie Edwards getting murdered on Christmas Eve, stop people like dear nine-year-old Olivia Pratt-Corbell getting murdered in her own home, because we take the industry away from the bad guys, and I mean, I guess you could give it, you could give hours and hours of answer to, to what I'm about to ask. But I mean, for anything that is legal and regulated, they'll they'll I guess by definition, there's going to be rules to that legality. Like I don't know, you know, the gear's got to look like this, and you can only buy X amount or whatever the rules are. Yep. So there'll always be the people who can't get serviced by the by the legal side of it. That there would therefore always be some illegal side of it. How would you stop that? Or is it just because if it's legalized and it's taxed, therefore the government are going to think, fuck it, we've got plenty of money at stake here. We'll actually do a proper job of fixing it. The government will make billions and billions and billions, and so will the retailers. Absolutely billions. We'll reduce the prison population. We'll have money to educate kids away from drugs. We can train people in prison to give them proper, you know, 
reading and writing skills and vocational skills. And the reason I'm holding up three fingers in answer to your question is we have to beat the criminals on three fronts to make this work. Number one, price. Simple. That's so easy because drugs are only the cost they are because everybody involved in the dealing puts a levy on their involvement in it. So the person that ships it from Colombia to Africa, they have to get paid. The person who ships it from Africa to Spain, they have to get paid. The person that gets it from Spain through Europe to the UK, at every stage, somebody lumps on their wages. So first of all, we have to beat them on price. Secondly, we have to beat them on purity so that the drugs are better, purer. That's easy because the drugs under my vision will be manufactured in a licensed factory. So of course they'll be purer and they won't have the toxins in it and the poisons and all the unpleasant cutting agents that unscrupulous drug dealers put in there. And thirdly, which will be a challenge, but it's easily done, availability. In other words, the drugstores, which I unimaginatively name them, will have to be open 24-7, like so many petrol stations are. Price, purity, availability. Beat the criminals on that, they got nowhere to go. Now, I'm not saying that every drug dealer is then going to follow a law-abiding life and they'll all be queuing up at the job centre to get legitimate employment. Of course they won't. And some people will want to carry out criminality elsewhere. Well, many criminals are morphing onto the internet anyway, so I'm sure a proportion will go there. And we might see a rise in other types of crime. But so much crime revolves around illegal drugs. I was talking to a mate of mine the other day who's a senior magistrate. And he says, Peter, every case that comes through my, on my list, that comes through my court, is drugs, 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 drugs. Either drugs charges or drug related in one way, form or another. Including, of course, yes, murders by the bucket load. Well, I like your theory. I like, I like your stories. And uh, it's been a pleasure having you here, buddy. Matt, it's been a great honour. Thank you very much for having me. And to everybody that aren't seen on camera or heard I'd like to thank them all very much as well and you mentioned uh, as well just before you go you mentioned your website where um, and your four books are you on social media anywhere else people yeah, can find I'm, you yeah I'm, I'm Peter Blexley B-L-E-K-S-L-E-Y on Twitter Facebook LinkedIn Insta TikTok although my content on TikTok is a bit sporadic and hugely embarrassing because it's usually involved alcohol and dancing <laughs> Uh, Peter, well, thanks a lot again, buddy, and uh, I look forward to talking to you again in the future. Thanks for having me, Matt. Thanks. Hold up. 